Good morning everyone. My name is Sri and I will be your moderator this evening and I would like to welcome you all to Bero Insights, our series of webinars. Our topic for today is the secondary market research challenge in pharma, an inside view on how to overcome the perceived market monopoly. Something I just want to mention up front here is that uh, we have had the maximum number of registrants for this webinar uh, until date. You know, this has been the highest. And we all know who that uh, market monopoly <laughs> supplier is. So I won't be mentioning the name, so we all know who that is. So throughout the course of this presentation, we will be referring to that supplier as the monopolistic service provider. Before we begin, some uh, basic set of instructions. Uh, if you have a question or would like to post a question, on the control panel, you will see a questions box as indicated in the red, in the red rectangular box here. Please type your questions in and I, your moderator, will receive it. And I will ask those questions at an appropriate time during the presentation or towards the end of the presentation. If you're having connection problems, request you to go to your email where we had sent you an invitation with the webinar link. You can try clicking on that link again. If still any problems persist, request you to email Puneet our marketing executive, his email is mentioned here, as well as in the email invitation that you received. So let me go ahead and quickly introduce our uh, presenter for this evening. His name is uh, Angad Singh. He is a senior research analyst at Bureau from our marketing services domain. So he specializes in uh, tracking various marketing categories, including primary and secondary research and many of his work has revolved around clients mainly in the Fortune 500 companies. A lot of his work revolves around negotiating strategies and formulating category procurement strategies. So without further ado, Angat, I think uh, they are all here, so let me pass it on to you and uh, fire away. Thank you, Sri. So our focus on today's discussion in, is on the existing monopoly challenge that pharmaceutical organizations continue to witness. In the course of my discussion, I'll be addressing the persisting bottlenecks and defining a strategy that buyers of secondary pharmaceutical market research could implement so as to negate the market monopoly. Now, over the course of my presentation, I will be covering up the demand scenario, demand management, I'll justify the monopolistic control and also define how buyer-side procurement can counter the market monopoly. Now before I get into talking about the dynamics that are shaping up in the pharmaceutical secondary market research industry, let us touch upon the pharmaceutical industry and see what's happening in that space. Now, as we all know that there are a number of patents that are about to expire or go off the list, which brings us to the patent cliff that is expected in 2015. It is known that in 2012, a similar patent cliff with opportunity loss in terms of revenue was as I as I as thirty five billion dollars. But it is expected that in twenty fifteen this number could go up to as high as thirty eight billion dollars. Now talking about patents, this brings us to the question as to what's in store from a generic drug perspective. Well, from generics perspective, it is known that a number of governments have identified the rise in inflation and are thus trying to bring down the cost of living, which in turn defines that they are growing the emphasis of reducing healthcare costs, healthcare costs being one of the prime factors that has been driving up the cost of living. Now it is also a well-known fact that governments such as US and UK are amongst those that have been visibly voicing their opinion in terms of promoting the use of generic drugs. Now why am I trying to highlight these two perspectives in terms of the pharmaceutical industry dynamics? Well, what I'm trying to bring in here from a secondary market research perspective is that there is going to be increased dependency on the secondary market research category. Now well, all of us know that pharmaceutical organizations spend about 10 to 50 million US dollars 
on secondary market research. Out of this, 60 to 70 percent of this amount is spent on the monopolistic service provider. That's right. The reason why buyers prefer to pay as high as 60 to 70 percent of their spend on the monopolistic service provider is for the fact that it provides them with indispensable insights in the form of patients, payers, prescribers, and also buyers make use of the pharmaceutical consultant panel of this service provider to understand competitor landscape and drug positioning and similar services. Now, I would like to justify further as to why do I still stick on the fact that there could be increased dependency on secondary market research so, so category. Now well, let us study three scenarios that lie ahead of the buyers of pharmaceutical organizations so as to ensure they maintain or continue to grow the top line. Now the first scenario being entering new markets with the same product or the second scenario that lies ahead is that they could identify new markets and also new products to be launched in those. The last scenario that we could study and come across is the fact that they could retain the market but launch new products in the same market. The perspective that I'm trying to highlight here is that all these scenarios lead us into increased dependency on data insights and pharma consultants to ensure that they could maximize or maintain their top line growth. Now talking about this, you will, I would like to take you all into a similar scenario from the past. The pa it is understood or witnessed or the industry of pharmaceutical has in witnessed the patent cliff in 2011-2012. Now it is also a known fact that an opportunity loss in terms of revenue was as high as $35 billion with individual opportunity losses for companies going up to $6.1 billion US dollars to about an average of $3 billion for <clears throat> the top five pharmaceutical organizations. Now all of these factors meant that there was an increased demand for secondary market research services. Now I would like to draw your attention away from this to a parallel even that was taking place at the same time, which was the world was still recovering from the economic slowdown. Now why am I trying to bring in the perspective of the world recovering from the economic slowdown? Well, from a buyer and a supplier perspective of secondary market research, this meant a lot. From a supplier's perspective, it meant that service providers were unable or finding it difficult to sustain the economic slowdown. while buyers face budgetary constraints. Now all of these factors drove the need or the urgency to come up with an innovative procurement trend. In our case, the single base service provider dependency trend. The single base service provider dependency trend meant that buyers of pharmaceutical market secondary market research could identify a single service provider with which they could consolidate their entire secondary market research research spend and source various services from. Now this basically evolved as a win-win situation for the buyer as well as the service provider. Why do I state that? The fact can be complemented by, the, by us understanding that it was able to accommodate the budgetary cuts while the service provider was assured of continuous revenue in flux. Now talking about the scenario from the past, let us first try and understand how did buyers narrow down upon their single base service provider? Before I get into understanding what strategies did, buyer use, did the buyers use to narrow down upon the base service provider, I would want you all to revisit the buyer's concerns which were budget cuts on an average of 3 to 5 percent per region that was seen and also supply risk which meant they were quite uncertain about the financial stability of most service providers during this phase. While the buyers were busy strategizing as to how to overcome these concerns and effectively source secondary market research services, the service provider offered them with, what, with exactly what they needed. The first fact being it was able to display financial stability and this fact can be complemented from its overall revenue it's being which is noted at or measured at 3.1 2.1 billion 
while its resource revenue and net profits was 750 million and 311 million respectively. Now talking about this, another interesting highlight was the ability of the service provider to service clients across geographies in markets where the service provider with the buyers needed the demand to be serviced. The service provider ensured that this was done through organic and inorganic expansions. From an organic expansions perspective, the service provider set up new business units, while from an inorganic expansion perspective, the service provider got into M&A strategies and made sure it acquired certain service portfolios that were not under its gamut of services. Talking about this, the last point, which is the eye catcher of all, was the service provider operated on low profit margins as low as 7 to 10 percent. The interesting part about this is that this particular move or strategy by the service provider ensured that competition in the market could not operate at such low profit margins as they were already finding it difficult to sustain. At the same time, the low profit margins ensured that buyers' budgetary constraints could be met. All of these factors together contribu contributed towards attracting more client portfolios. Now, talking about this, I would like to further justify the monopolistic control of the service provider, which brings us into the silent highlights of the strategy. A first point of discussion here is the ownership for outsourcing was on the service provider. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, buyers of secondary pharmaceutical market research needed a gamut of services to ensure that they could maintain or maximize top line growth. Certain services were not under the portfolio of the incumbent service provider. What this meant was that the service provider was took on the ownership of bringing in these services for its clients or on behalf of its clients, buyers, by outsourcing those tasks to a third party vendor. This meant that buyers were saved upon from additional time and cost of running RFI and RFQ processes. RFI meaning request for information, RFI, RFQ meaning request to quote. Now on the other hand, another interesting highlight was the capability of the service provider to work on a captive working model, that is an FTE basis. This together with the on-site support ensured that buyers of secondary pharmaceutical market research had real-time help and information. This at two at a time when the demand was at its peak. The third or the fourth point of year of debate that was on highlight from the service provider strategy was services at competitive prices. Like I stated earlier, most of the service providers' services were, were given out wherein the service provider's profit margins were only 7 to 10 percent. Well, these four factors certainly contributed towards justifying the monopolistic control, but the icing on the cake really came in from global contracts, which meant that the buyers of pharmaceutical secondary market research could consolidate their spend and invest or engage with the single service providers. It was these notable factors that ensured the service provider of continuous revenue influx, hence justifying the monopolistic control. Now you would be wondering as to how has this monopolistic control or monopoly grown or moved in the and in time that is over the last two to three years? And the answer for that is yes, the market monopoly has certainly reduced and the fact can be complemented by the numbers that are now on your screens with at least or an average of 30 service alternate service providers across each region. Now these service providers are very strong alternatives and the reasons why I call them strong alternatives will be justified as I explain and take you further into how these service providers operate. Now from multiple service provider interactions and interactions with industry experts, I have learned that there are about 160 to 170 service providers that compete across the perceived service provider or perceived giant service lines. This means that they could either they could provide services to buyers at country or regional levels, either across the service lines of the perceived giant or by therapeutic area 
such as oncology, immunology, or diabetes, and much more. Now, an interesting fact that I stated was that these service providers are strong alternatives, and this is the reason why I call them as strong alternatives. Apart from competing on the service lines of the perceived giant, they have the capability of offering services at 10 to 15 percent of the cost lower than what the perceived giant offers its buyers. Now I would like to drive your attention away to my next point which was very important in driving us to a strategy that we are trying to formulate for our buyers. This being that there are two potentially two service providers across the globe that compete at approximately 55 to 70 percent across the service lines of the perceived giant. That's right, 55 to 70 percent of your demand could be debundled and sourced from an alternate service provider, thus getting your cost savings or helping you all realize other value benefits. This means that two-thirds of your demand is actually not under a bottleneck right now. Now talking about this monopoly, let us get into how can the buyer side procurement overcome the market monopoly. Now well, in its initial phases, what buyers need to do is identify the presence of mar identify markets with the presence of alternatives. Now through various studies that we've carried out or I've carried out in my past, I've understood that key markets like US, UK, France and other far emerging nations have the presence of strong alternatives and I quote them as strong alternatives for the rationals I stated earlier, which being competing across service lines and offering services at competitive prices. Now, after in, during the initial phase, after the identification of markets, buyers can then step by step go about debundling, go about debundling the services, which means that services like payer insights, prescriber insights, patent insights, physician insights, and similar services could be sourced or procured from alternate service providers that are present across geographies. Now this drives us to a phase one engagement strategy, which means that during this phase, service providers can engage with alternatives on a short term basis. Short term basis means contracts ranging between three months to one year. During this phase, the service providers could be evaluated and also measured on the capability or ability to serve Fortune 500 pharmaceutical organizations. Once the service providers have been filtered, evaluated and filtered out, this drives us to the next phase, which is engaging with your preferred service provider list on long-term basis. Long-term contracts ranging between two to three years. Now what we want you to understand from this is that the preferred service providers would also include the perceived market monopolistic giant. The reason I state that is because a parallel engagement with the alternate service providers and the perceived giant would ensure a platform to benchmark services. Apart from the fact that you could also build upon creating service provider competition. Now what buyers need to keep in mind is that there needs to be a performance evaluation metrics in place which brings us to the next phase which is review the performance of service providers on a timely basis. Now what buyers need to keep in mind here is that the service providers need to be evaluated on the fact of the value benefits that the, the service providers provide, the accuracy of information the buyers receive and ease of integration in working with. Now it is these factors together that define a hybrid sourcing strategy or the way forward for buyers of secondary pharmaceutical market research to adopt so as to negate the perceived market monopoly. Now I would like to draw your attention back to the evaluation phase and elaborate a little further as to what do I mean by value benefits, accuracy of insights and ease of integration. When I state value benefits, I mean buyers receiving preferential payback terms or can bring in the service providers to work on a pay for performance model. The accuracy of insights could be measured by having a set of predefined KPIs in place that would measure the database based on its database synchronization rate, the refresh rate, server downtime, and other similar key performance indicators 
that could use, be used to measure the accuracy of insights. Lastly, the point of ease of integration basically defines the ability of the service provider to bring on board service innovation or technologies that are essential to meet the buyer's business objectives. Now, since we all know that for a fact that <clears throat> if there is going to be a change in strategy, there are potential challenges that the buyer side procurement may face during this process. In my presentation, I have understood and identified three major potential risks that buyer side procurement could face, and I have defined those as follows. The first major potential risk that we come across is that the market leader, that is the perceived giant, could buy out competition. Now, well, let us see what, if, what would happen if this had to take place. It clearly defines that the service provider would have the power to negotiate with the buyers, leaving the buyers with nothing at all. Now, the reason I state this is because in the past also, it has been observed that the service provider has increased the cost of its, service of its services and leaving the buyers with nothing but to engage them with. Now, well, an interesting highlight that I'm going to bring out is the possibility of the market leader buying out this competition is low. The reason why I state that out is from the fact that I quoted earlier that the amount of market competition is high. The reason I say the competition in the market is high is because there are approximately 160 to 170 service providers that lie out there competing across the perceived giants service line. Now talking about this point, it is interesting enough to know that the, the market would remain pretty competitive for the next two to three years as buying out or entering into M&A or inorganic or organic expansions with all of these service providers and the perceived giant is practically impossible and hence the amount or the possibility of the market leader buying out competition is pretty low. Talking about this risk, there is an in increased risk in terms of or there is a risk of increased sourcing complexity. Now, What do I mean by sourcing complexity? Now, as buyers of secondary pharmaceutical market research are expanding the supply base, it means that more number of service providers need to be evaluated, contracted and managed either locally, regionally or some at global levels. This means that there would be an increased sourcing complexity. However, through various studies of industry journals and interactions with multiple experts, I have understood that the central-led procurement structure is the go-to model so as to negate or minimize the increased sourcing complexities that buyers of secondary pharmaceutical market research are bound to witness. Now let us take a few minutes or spend some time in understanding what do I mean by a central-led procurement structure. Well, in simple terms, it is a three-tier structure wherein we see the corporate purchasing or the corporate control at regional levels. What I'm trying to highlight here is it's a simple structure wherein you see centralized procurement. However, the buying is done across regions or at regional levels. The main advantage of implementing the central-led procurement structure is that buyers could or the regional procurement managers or heads could highlight or escalate regional nuances or local nuances and difficulties across regions and thus having more visibility in procurement. Talking about this brings us to a third potential risk that buyers may encounter which is increased cost of harmonization. Now, what do I mean by cost of harmonization? Harmonization costs could be those that are borne by the service by the the buyer side in order to bring in synergies between its procurement teams and various service providers that are on board. Now before I get into talking about how can increase harmonization costs be a potential risk further, let us understand a fact that as quoted earlier, buyers of secondary pharmaceutical market research can debundle up to 60 to 70 percent of their demand and source this from alternatives, which means that they could realize at least 5 to 10 percent of savings on the debundled purchasing of secondary market research services. Now, in parallel to this, a one-time investment would be required from a buyer's perspective on 
bringing in harmonization, which would be three to five percent of the spend area. So all of these factors would mean that in total, the realization of cost savings is from the second year itself for buy, for the buyer's perspective. Now, as I've been talking about the potential risk, I would have taken your attention away from the buyer's strategy. That is a hybrid strategy. And I would like to bring your attention back as to what's in it for you. Our first point being higher negotiation power. The reason I state higher negotiation power is due to the increased competition. Buyers of secondary pharmaceutical market research could attain or, or leverage upon discounts on pricing points. The second part being they could also in come across preferential pay uh, payback service provider terms. When I say preferential payback service provider terms, I mean in terms of service provider fee. Angat, if I may interrupt you here, the higher negotiating power, especially in terms of discounts, is on top of the already lesser charges that they, other service providers give in comparison to the monopolistic supplier, right? You said 10 to 15 percent. On top of that savings, they can still negotiate. So this is over that 10 to 15 percent, right? That's right, uh, Shri. So that, that the discounts on pricing points would actually come in further as buyers of secondary pharmaceutical market research could bundle their demand. Based on the demand or volume of demand, they could further negotiate apart from realizing the 5 to 10 percent of cost savings. Thanks. Talking about what's in it for the buyers brings us to a second point, which is the buyers are bound to encounter reduced supply risk. The reason why I state this is that in case a, a, any service provider, which is its preferred service provider of the buyer comes across as probably, uh, if I may state, as displaying financial instability or unwillingness to work on a buyer's term, the, the buyers always have the option to evaluate the untapped potentials of the vast supply base, in our case, nearly 160 to 170 alternatives. Talking about re reduced supply risk, in, would ensure that the next point, which is creating supply competition, is maintained. Well, parallel, parallel sourcing from the monopolistic service provider and also the alternatives would ensure that the buyers have a platform to evaluate and continuously monitor the performance of their service providers. This platform would ensure that the services of either service providers are scaled up to give best-in-class services to its buyers. From this, we come to the last point in terms of what's in it for you, which is the leveraging on value benefits. When I say about leveraging on value benefits, service providers could also help the buyers in moving away or avoiding additional costs. So this fact can be stated from higher negotiation power wherein service providers could give buyers a grace period of, of 15 days to one month apart from the estimated time that was stated to pay back the service provider fee. During this grace period, no additional cost or penalties of late fee payment may be paid. The second being is that the, the buyers could work on a pay for performance pricing model with its service providers. This would ensure another avenue to realize cost savings and also receive best in class services from its service providers. However, on that note, I would like to put a word of caution, which is buyers need to keep in mind that there is bound to be increased sourcing complexity. The reason why I state increased sourcing complexity is because there would be increased service providers in the supply base of the buyers, which means there would be a requirement to handle multiple contracts of various service providers. The second point that I would like to highlight, which buyers should keep in mind, is increased cost of harmonization. Well, like I said, they need to build internal, they, they might need to internally restructure. And when I say they, I mean buyers might need to internally restructure their procurement teams in order to ensure that there is synergies between the service providers and also the procurement teams. On that note, I would like to conclude this webinar's presentation by saying that the change is inevitable and the right time to evaluate the alternate service providers is now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angad. Uh, 
we do have some questions but I would say they're more of certain clarification more than you know very specific questions so uh, I'm just let, let's just go back on the slides to the risks you were talking about so obviously when you have to go to multiple source service providers you did mention like three top risks right okay. so uh, yes increased uh, sourcing complexity so one of the clarification here is hey I have a single supplier now he may be monopolistic but it's uh, easy for me it's one-stop shop but here you're trying to emphasize that yes there may be multiple service providers but you can still maintain the centralization and it's not really complex for the buyers procurement can you just rephrase that so you know what I mean right so what I'm trying to highlight from this perspective is that when you have a regional structure in place where which oversees the buying across the region uh, I'm trying to state that um, the highlights or difficulties from local procurement teams or regional procurement teams could be easily highlighted across geographies wherein there is transparency in terms of procurement and thus visibility uh, from a perspective that how do a multiple service providers or how can multiple service providers be handled at that first time got it thank you okay let's move on to the next slide where we have a another uh, clarification so increased uh, harmonization cost right so the second point you have mentioned implies five to ten percent savings on purchasing purchasing secondary market research services so is this like a worst case or a best case or is that like an averaged savings uh, thanks Shri, for that question uh, well uh, it is an average of savings across each region the reason I state it's an average of savings across each region is because most of these service providers are uh, of the operating magnitude uh, by region. They operate or pose challenges to the perceived monopoly by region. And hence, on a regional basis, the buyers are expected to, in, to probably realize a cost savings of 5 to 10 percent. And it is an averaged out savings. Uh, but what I want buyers to also know that apart from cost savings, there are a bunch of value benefits that lie in store for them. Yeah, that was my other question and <laughs> you have answered that already. So I have uh, another question here from one of our audience. Do you take into account in your service calculation the need for adapting our internal data structures? I think it's their company data structures. Because as often alternatives may also have different definitions of the data okay. so, so I like the question now during my um, how do I say during my study of this uh, entire um, monopoly challenge that buyers continue to face I have learned that most of the service providers are willing to restructure themselves in manners of in, 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 in ways in which the buyers could leverage from them the reason why they're willing to do this is because the attractiveness that buyers continue to hold in the market from a perspective of slightly smaller service providers in our case the alternative service providers however what needs to be kept in mind is that when buyers are engaging with these service providers they need to define a set of key performance indicators on the basis of which these alternatives could be evaluate, evaluated and measured and thus I still believe that the alternate service providers also hold immense potential in servicing Fortune 500 pharmaceutical companies. All right, thank you. Uh, if you can go on to the next slide, the next question is based on. Uh, um, no, I'm afraid this is not the slide. But anyways, I'll ask the question. So we did among these risks that we talk about going to other alternative service providers. How can there's over a hundred of them? What's the guarantee that you know they'll sustain reliability? So again, we are looking at an elaborate clarification of one of your risks for the buyer. Thank you, Sri. Uh, I appreciate this question. It's very interesting, and I would like to spend some time in answering this question. Now, uh, 
I'm going to jump back in a scenario from the past uh, where a top service provider that is our market monopoly or the monopolistic giant in the space of secondary pharmaceutical market research services was asked to scale up its service offerings and there was a lot of questions that were being posed by a number of buyers in terms of the credibility of the type of information they were attaining from its service provider. But this also meant that there was increased pressure on the service provider to ensure that in lesser turnaround time it could offer its buyers or clients the best so as to ensure that the buyers were retained. Now what I'm trying to say here is that the credibility with the alternate service providers, the credibility with the alternate service providers certainly lies there. This credibility could be evaluated in short periods of time which is by having a predefined set of KPIs in the form of understanding the service providers database synchronization rates that is how often are the databases synchronized this is this would also ensure that when a database is being synchronized across the globe it has been done in a specific time so that the amount of data redundancy could be reduced Apart from this, the data refresh rate is another key performance indicator in managing or evaluating the service provider. The data refresh rates basically means that how often are the data points in the databases updated on the basis of which the analysis on various in products, drugs, or competitors obtained. These are some of the databases or the KPIs on the database on the basis of which the credibility of the service providers could be measured and it takes only three months to one year to basically understand the service providers where they, where they lie and apart from this it also means that in three months to one year the service providers could also scale up their level of service offering in terms of accuracy of information and credibility of data. Awesome. So in three months to one year they can know that and in another year they can see their return on investment. That's right, Sri. That's exactly what I'm trying to state. Okay. So we have a, another clarification. So uh, if uh, you can go back to the slide on how much, you know, an average pharma company is spending on the monopolistic. Somebody you said about um, anywhere from 10 to 50 million, right? So can you give an uh, idea to our audience here? if you took the top 20 pharma companies, how much would the top three spend? How much would the, the, the 18, 19, and 20 spend? So we're trying to get the median from that uh, price range. Sure, Sri. I would like to answer that question as well. Uh, I'm going to throw in some numbers here to back what I'm going to be stating. Uh, the fact that um, in 2011, 2012, when the, when the globe was seeing the economic uh, or recovering, still recovering from the economic slowdown. There were a handful of clients, approximately two to three, being among the top five in terms of revenue from a pharmaceutical industry perspective. These clients spent nearly 45 to 50 million on the single service provider and ensured that it had they had no alternate service provider on the list. At the same time, there were certain regional pharmaceutical firms or uh, maybe that lie between 20 to 25 that spent about 12 to 15 million dollars. A region company. A regional company. In the, the upwards of 20 million. In the, uh, well, 12 to 15 is what we are stating here. These are the numbers that regional and top ph uh, pharmaceutical organizations usually spend. But if you want me to help you arrive at a median, the number would be between 25 to 35 million on an average, depending on the pharmaceutical organizations drug pipeline and also the clinical trial drug phase. These are factors that define the spend in broader scale, uh, areas on the service provider. Interesting. So more the pipeline, we are looking at excess of 50 million also? Potentially, yes. With the patent cliff expected in 2015, number of clients could actually exceed that number. And when I say a number of clients, I mean the top 10 pharmaceutical organizations. Okay. Uh, we have another question. So, in your analysis, did you identify some type of data 
that would be more likely to be debundled through the alternatives? Or will the strategy be more likely to be adopted for all types of data? I think that's a very good question. I like this question and I've highlighted this in uh, my uh, strategy uh, elaboration thing. I would like to drive down to that slide. Uh, give me a minute on that please. <clears throat> well as I arrive at the slide what I would like to state is that uh, uh, a large amount of uh, data insights in terms of payers, patients, physicians, uh, prescribers and many more are actually purchased at local or regional levels and it is this form of data services that are actually procured or could be procured through alternatives since they have the capabilities of providing such insightful information. This information could be used for different therapeutic areas or also different service lines depending on what the buyers require and thus on the slide now you can see is that services like payer insights and I'm repeating myself here payer insights patent insights, prescriber insights, patient and physician insights are some of the services that could actually be debundled and procured locally or regionally with alternative service providers. Okay, uh, I guess uh, that's the end of the questions but I think there's one more, uh, let's go to the last slide where you say <laughs> the change is now, you know the time to act is basically now which is maybe tomorrow morning, this evening for as us, soon as, as soon as possible. So outside of the monopolistic uh, service provider, pharma companies also subscribe to other service providers even at this moment it's not like there's always an extra spend for external intelligence so very likely they have subscription to an alternative service provider. So this should make it easier for the clients, right? since they would have other subscriptions too. What, what's your take on that? Uh, very true Sri, I completely second what you just said uh, and the reason why I said the transitioning could be easy. Uh, the reason I say this is uh, two reasons why I say it's the right time to transition now considering the fact that <clears throat> in the future, that is in 2015, there's a patent cliff expected and there would be increased demand. The reason why you could start debundling your demand from now is that at the peak of your demand you have supply service provider competition and thus could realize the value benefits that we've listed down. So yes, it would be an easy transition. It does not, it sounds a little difficult. There would be complexities and challenges but there's no fun without any challenge in, in transitioning whether it be from one place to another or from one strategy to another and that's my take on it. So this also ties in with your point that by three months to one year you would get to know an alternative supplier very well, right? right. So by 2015, while many pharma companies are playing catch up, the people who attended today's uh, webinar would have an unfair advantage, right? I hope so and that's exactly <laughs> what my research helps them arrive at. <laughs> okay, thank you on this. Uh, that wraps up our presentation and one of the questions is, Will the audience receive a copy of the presentation with the recording? Yes, you will receive that. Our marketing team would send you an email on how to, you know, get your hands on that recording. That being said, uh, thank you very much again for attending today's webinar and uh, we hope to see you again next week. Uh, have a great day everyone. Good night.